Hello, everybody, and welcome to the first podcast of The Ill-Fated Wives of Henry VIII, brought to you by the founder, Emma Holbrook. Today, I'm absolutely delighted to introduce Gareth Russell, one of my absolute favourite historians and an award-winning author. So welcome, Gareth. Oh, thank you so much for having me, Emma. It's a real pleasure. No problem at all. For those who are not familiar with Gareth, why don't you just tell them a little bit about yourself, Gareth, and what is it you do? Sure. Well, as you said, I'm a historian and biographer and actually by sort of perfect eerie happenstance i'm we're you can see this but um we're we're speaking from heaver castle today i'm i'm here um helping the brilliant kate mccaffrey and owen emerson um with a new sort of installation at heaver so some of my job is going around looking at places like this which is such a privilege but my first major book was a biography of queen catherine howard called young and damned and fair and i've written a few books about medieval history and also early 20th century history as well i just got your um, most recent book on the queen mother absolutely loved it oh thank you I think I read it in like a day. <laughs> Your Catherine Howard book, uh, Young Damned in the Fair, is absolutely wonderful and one of, one of my best books. Oh, thank you. That's really uh, kind. Because I just think you have such a good direction in telling these women's stories and bringing them to light. Because I think, as you know, some women in history do get a bad rep. Sure, on sure. Represented absolutely. the best. And that's kind of what we're here to talk about today yeah. is the marriage between Henry VII, otherwise known as Henry Tudor, and Elizabeth of York and how that is presented. So I'm just going to start off with the first question then, if that's all right. So as everyone knows, the story of Henry VIII and his six wives, obviously through the classic nursery rhyme, divorce be had died, divorce be had survived. But I guess a lot of people do agree that he kind of overshadows his parents a lot. Not a lot of people do know a, a bit about their relationship, their marriage. And even so, it's not necessarily cast in the best light, especially with that of Elizabeth of York, as a lot of people do know. She's been most represented in Philippa Gregory's work, which has now been televised in her The Cousins War series, especially that of the White Princess. I was just wondering if you could talk to us a bit about that. Because in Philippa Gregory's work, she portrays Elizabeth as having engaged in an incestuous affair with her uncle, Richard III. And I was wondering if you could talk about the validity of this and whether you think that's a valid claim or not. Because there is a lot of argument about this, isn't there? Mm. Well, I think sometimes, absolutely, sorry, I should I should begin by saying, Philippa Gregory, the success of those books, they've sort of been within publishing an absolute juggernaut. And they have a lot of really devoted fans, and they have been turned into very successful television series. I Actually, for a different project, I made a list of some of the actors who played some of Philippa Gregory's characters. My goodness, it's sort of <laughs> an unbelievable rolodex. What I did not know, just about I'm sort of sharing this, Emma, it's like a historical tidbit, because I just <laughs> found it out. It must have been really early in his career, but Andrew Garfield was in The Other Boleyn Girl. He played Francis yeah. Weston. Clearly missed it. Anyway, <laughs> I think the book has, the book has, sorry, those books, I should say, have done a lot to lift Henry VII and Elizabeth of York from that obscurity that you're talking about. Because actually, there's there, there hasn't really been anything on them in pop culture since the series 50 years ago in the 1970s called The Shadow of the Tower, which is one of my absolute favourite television series. And it's all about the reign of, of Henry VII. So in terms of the the incest storyline, one of the things I will say is that sometimes Philippa Gregory gets quite a hard rap from people who I think blame her because some of her readers adopt the novel storyline as if they're historical fact. Mm. And, you know, sorry, I should point out also, Dr. Gregory, is she, she's a doctor, I think, from Edinburgh uh, in 18th century history, but she also has written nonfiction books and she has a new one coming out I believe on sort of the history of women in the British Isles but so I, I'm just drawing a distinction yeah, and, her, and her novels so these novels I think a novelist a historical novelist is operating under a different standard to historian in that they have to adopt a theory and present it as fact for characterization to make sense so for instance if you were to look at the competing theories about was George Boleyn bisexual gay or straight different historians have different views on that but if I was writing a novel about George I kind of have to pick one so with regards to the theory about Elizabeth of York and Richard III having an incestuous relationship, that was current in and around the time. We know as historians that there was also you know, claims that Anne and George Boleyn had an incestuous relationship, and we don't believe that. But a historian did recently resurrect, I think a few years before, um, a historian called Lisa Hilton, who wrote a really 
I love this book. It's an excellent work of medieval history called Queen's Consort. Mm -hmm. And it, it's a brilliant book that covers all the queens of England from Matilda of Flanders through to Elizabeth of York. And in her last two chapters, one on Anne Neville and the other on Elizabeth of York, Lisa Hilden does argue that she believes that some of the documentary evidence and the court itineraries indicates that there was an inappropriate relationship between Elizabeth and Richard. And that, or perhaps slightly more specifically, that Anne Neville might have suspected that there was one. And so I think in regards that, Philippa is just, ta you know, Philippa Gregory is taking a, a story, that theory that Lisa Hilton has and, and turning it into, into the, the world of her character because she has to pick one. I would say I find Lisa Hilton's argument really interesting and very well made. It did make me wonder. I don't know if it necessarily fully convinced mm -hmm. me that, that Richard and Elizabeth had an incestuous relationship as uncle and niece. I suppose it, what it did was it convinced me that more people at the time might have thought that, that something was going on between Richard and Elizabeth than I had previously thought. But I have to say, just from a personal perspective, I wasn't ultimately convinced by Lisa Hilton's argument that the evidence that we have is enough to make that conclusion. I don't know if I, I'm describing that well. I think there's a really good breadcrumb trail of why people were suspicious, but it was nowhere near enough the evidence that you would need to make that argument in a non-fiction book. So I understand why Philippa picked that argument from Lisa uh, Hilton book but i would if people want to look a little bit more at the documentary angle i could you can go and have a look at queen's consort I, and mm -hmm. to the best of my knowledge there hasn't been another book that's really gone into it in detail i could be wrong but yeah i think she was i think it probably does seem likely that Anne neville may have suspected something yeah. or it, it's very possible it's very possible but you know how many times in history do people suspect something and it's completely wrong mm -hmm. you know that as in and it happens today so we've been in conversations where someone's like i think something's going on between those two and they are so far off the mark and i think um, that's something with historical fiction sorry to interrupt is that people run readers have a suspected this happened is that a lot of people who do read historical fiction that might not necessarily know the history behind it they might yeah. adopt the ideas that historians give as the truth and of course that's not saying that Philip Gregory is wrong or that another author is right like just as yourself you give forward ideas yourself that's based on your research it just shows that the influence that an historical author can mm. have on someone doesn't it and I think that's totally. the boundary to, that people do cross is mistaking I... facts from fiction yeah, I completely agree. And I also find that quite sad because I think they're robbing themselves of the joy of historical fiction, which mm -hmm. is that you don't have to come away with conclusions about it. You can lose yourself in a quasi-imagined world. And sometimes, you know, as... I mean, I have to say, actually, I mean, I remember there was a book Philip Gregory wrote called The Boleyn Inheritance, in which yes. she splits the, yeah, the narrative between Anne of Cleves, Catherine Hard, and Lady Rochford. I thought that was such a brilliant idea. And it's a really remorselessly unpleasant Lady Rochford, but it was really well imagined and plot it was there was such a sense of atmosphere in that book and i think if you you know what i'm just picking one because we're talking about philippa gregory but you know there are books that she's done that are so atmospheric and enjoyable and as a reader sink into them and enjoy mm. them and there are many margaret george is another one who has done some absolutely extraordinary epic works like cleopatra and elizabeth the first and mary queen of scots and a doorstopper of a book about henry the eighth it's, it's a great book but the, but the joy of historical fiction is that you don't have to take those conclusions you don't have to be repeating them as historical fact. You are losing yourself in a world that's part historical and also the gift of this novelist's imagination. So enjoy it for what it is. What I also think is quite frustrating is I have people me ask to just sort of look back. People who have maybe read a, a novel about Henry the Seventh or I don't know Marie Antoinette or or any period Titanic or any period history, and they're so inspired and interested that they come into maybe a, a group or a thread or something and they type in asking these questions, and it's clear they've got them from the novel. And people who have only read nonfiction can sometimes be very unkind to them and mock them and shut them down. We're all just trying to have a conversation and be entertained sometimes and be provoked into thought other times. I don't think we should be too harsh on historical novelists or on historical novelist readers at all. Life's tough enough. Enjoy, enjoy what you enjoy and then have a conversation afterwards if you want to. And I think that's the great thing about these books is that they, for someone like myself who grew up researching history, loving history, it almost gives you a bit of an escape 
really, because there are so many mm. theories, such mm. as this one with Elizabeth and, and Richard. We don't know the truth. There's a possibility mm. we might never know the truth. Like books like these allow us to have almost a theory that's brought to life almost. We can visualize it, we can mm. see it. And especially if there are books that are contrasting it, especially with Anne Boleyn, there's so many yeah. books about her, so many different portrayals that allows us as readers to do that. And I think that's just the great thing about, about books. Why well, I love history is just, there's endless possibilities. Of course there is. And I think, and look, I mean, I absolutely will say that there, it, I, I do understand the concern of some historians with regards books like, say, Wolf Hall, that made a very, very big play in their in their publicity about how accurate they were. That is when I think you kind of put yourself up for major criticism at that mm. point, which Wolf Hall actually ended up not getting. But I think, you know, for me, there were, it's really interesting when you ask yourself, what are inaccuracies? You know, is it something like presenting a character wrong? Or is it something about, you know, Wolf Hall gets all the little details right, mm. but it's also a very secular story. It's a very non-religious story, which is so antithetical to the world of the children. So there are different kinds of things that I understand sometimes when people get a bit miffed. If a book like Wolf Hall and its sequels bring up the bodies and the mirror and the light, if there is a really big play, and The Crown did this a little bit actually earlier on, I think it's mm. all the Netflix series, they made a big play on how well researched it was. And to me, yeah. that's always a little bit of, that could be a slight on goal for them because you're kind of robbing yourself of the defense and joy of what historical fiction could be. And especially with mentioning the crown, that's got a load of controversy for perhaps mm -hmm. even shining too much on the truth, especially with the royal marriages and with the recent betrayal of Diana and things like that. That's got a, a yeah. load of controversy. So that's also sometimes don't shed too much truth in a sense. Yeah, well, I think, I mean, I think the thing that when the crown has moments where I kind of just think, why on earth was that necessary? I mean, these that, that bizarre episode on the Romanovs where... They make Queen Mary the reason they're not let in. And the episode in the Queen Mother's Nieces was pretty jaw-dropping. But I think, I mean, certainly what you will always struggle with is if you're, and this is not the crime's fault per se, this mm. is just what happens when you get closer and closer to people who are alive or have immediate family still alive. You know, when you have a very, very sympathetic Diana in season four, and then a much less sympathetic Diana in season five, you're you're going to annoy both these camps yeah. uh, on this, and I think people are very invested in it. And sometimes you can see the not just the crime, but any show about modern major figures, you can see them sometimes trying to please everyone. So, for instance, Prince Charles is the hero of the crime in season three, and he's the villain in season four. It's very, it's a very interesting thing I think to look back on, but. I mean, it's like Bombshell or The Loudest Voice or The Assassination of Gianni Versace. There will be people who will say there's a point at which the living don't get to sacrifice truth for our entertainment. That that mm. will be an argument. That, that's a big argument that we're having as a culture and a society. So I understand that. And I suppose that's the good thing, if you can call it that. For a lot of historical fiction that is written or portrayed in the media, it's about people that have been dead for 500 years. Totally. So they totally. can get away with it. Which brings us to totally. our ne my next point, actually, about how there is a growing belief within the historical community that Henry and Elizabeth did come to love each other in their marriage, arranged marriage of that, which obviously was the norm, especially for a princess and obviously now a king. And there is some evidence to suggest this, obviously looking at the fact that from our knowledge, he never took a mistress, although there is questions mm -hmm. to the nature of his relationship with a lady, Catherine Gordon, which is portrayed within the books by Philippa Gregory, and how he valued her opinion in political affairs and how he locked himself away after her, her death for months, I believe. I think someone estimated it was five to six. But what's your take on this argument? Obviously, there is evidence to suggest this, but is there evidence to say that it might have just been a well-arranged marriage? I think I, I don't know about the Catherine Gordon thing. I'm slightly dubious about it, but I, it, it's not my area. And I, I could be so again, like Richard and Elizabeth, I could be pulled either way, depending mm. on if you get it good enough evidence. I suppose with anything, that's true. Certainly, that is. I do think it it was a relatively happy marriage. It, it's more unusual for arranged marriages like that to end up filled with loathing. It is. Mm. It is actually surprisingly rare, and the reason why we remember the ones that were is because they were commented on. More often, they sort of clicked along quite contentedly together and mm. they made the best of it because that is what they had been brought up to expect, both of them. 
both sides of the marriage. Henry and Elizabeth, there is an unusual amount of evidence of Mm. emotional and physical intimacy. She certainly had a great deal of influence at court. We also find them collaborating on projects like the design of Henry VII's new palace at Richmond that we now Mm. know Elizabeth helped him design. She had a say in the dating and procedures of their eldest daughter's marriage and their sons. She was very involved in both, or their son Arthur, I should say. And also there is, of course, that very famous story that I, I personally don't see any reason to discount about the co- how much they comforted each other when Arthur mm. died. So I think there is a great deal of evidence that the marriage did come to be one of love and respect and, 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 and happiness. I mean, all things considered, Elizabeth did have difficulties that she had to navigate it was unusual to be the senior princess of the previous royal family not unheard of but it was unusual and particularly given the bloodiness and the internecine nature of the wars of the roses elizabeth was carrying a lot on her shoulders mm. in terms of what the York Yorkists could do. Not just the Yorkists who never accepted her marriage to Henry, but the Yorkists who did and did so begrudgingly, and her large number of her sisters who were still alive. Mm. So I, I think Elizabeth had a political tightrope to walk that she walked with remarkable skill. And I also think it's if you look, however, at the personal dynamic of it, compared to what a lot of other queens endured at that period, chief amongst them their husband's elevation of a mistress or illegitimate children, Elizabeth did not have to endure any of that. And even mm. if we do accept, let's say it's sake of argument that there was something between Henry the Seventh and Lady Catherine Gordon. It's still, it was still so discreetly done that you and I aren't sure of it. So I think even if in the worst case scenario, Henry VII did have an affair, it obviously was not significant enough that Elizabeth was humiliated by it because we still aren't sure it happened. Exactly. So in that, yeah, so in that sense, I think to me, all of the evidence suggests a happy marriage by the by contemporary standards. And one of the things that I I think we see happening in Tudor history sometimes is there are we do sometimes query sources and I do understand people who query this the I think it's the, the Bacon story that they that they comforted each other when Prince Arthur died some people have queried that just because you can discount one source does not mean that you you can replace it with its opposite in terms of tone you know there just because we can query some of the sources about their marital felicity we cannot find any that indicate marital strife. The the worst that we get is a comment. I think the, the Spanish ambassador was Don Pedro de Alea. It might have been, I think it was Alea, who said some mild tension over etiquette between Elizabeth of York and Mark of Beaufort. That's it. Mm. So there is no evidence at all of strife. So if even if we just count all the evidence of happiness, there's none that suggests misery. And I think for both of them, that's a fairly happy state of affairs. And I think the thing is, even if there was tension between Margaret and Elizabeth, there's going to be. I mean, their mother and mother-in-law and daughter, the yeah. same with a husband and a wife. And I think that's a lot. I think is behind why Elizabeth isn't perhaps as recognised and perhaps disgraced queens. I mean, as you said, she never had to go through, as we can mm. see through what we've been presented through with evidence, there was no an affair to our knowledge. Yeah. There was no illegitimate children and the fact that he did count her as an equal almost through how he included Mm. her in decisions. Might that have had an effect in how she's not perhaps brought to light as saying Anne Boleyn or Catherine of Aragon, both women who had to go through horrible divorce, more like an annulment in Anne's case, and had Mm. to suffer the loss of their children in being taken away from them. Well, the most brutal way to describe Catherine of Aragon and Anne Boleyn by contemporary standards is that they're failures. That is how they, they were seen and, and unfortunately regularly described. There is a very strong argument to be made that Elizabeth of York is not remembered because she was so good at the job and mm-hmm. she was so successful at the role of queen consort. And actually, if we look back at some of the earlier queens in England, I'm thinking of Henry I's wife, Adelisa of Louvain, and Edward I's second wife, Margaret of France. There is an argument that very successful queen consorts who followed the protocol 
and the expectations to the letter and received a lot of applause at the time. They're forgotten by history. There's a great paper by Dr. Estelle Frank, who I think a lot of people will know from her recent joint biography of Elizabeth I and Catherine de' Medici. But she wrote an academic paper on one of Catherine de' Medici's daughters-in-law, another Elizabeth, Elizabeth of Austria, who was married to King Charles IX of France. Mm. And in it, she says, how on earth does this queen, who is universally admired and praised when she is Queen of France, become completely forgotten uh, by the history bits? And it's because Elizabeth of Austria, like Elizabeth of York, did the job so well. And that's not to say, I'm always, by the way, slightly dubious of people who say Anne Boleyn was quote-unquote a bad queen consort and didn't know what to do. I just think mm. that's ridiculous. But in turn, if you were to say... I don't think we would really remember Catherine of Aragon that much had the marriage ended with them still married. Um, we might remember Anne Boleyn maybe in the way we remember Elizabeth Woodville or Eleanor of Aquitaine, someone who became queen through strife. But there's no question that Catherine of Aragon and Anne Boleyn's name is written in their failure and above all, or as I would see it, mm-hmm. in their tragedy. And I think there's an element to which n- those two are remembered because of the scale of what was at stake, because of them not having a normal queenship thanks to their husbands i mean whims is probably the kind way to put it but i also think there is you know the other their four immediate successors his four final wives they are remembered because it was so unusual what he did there is an element to which we are those six wives even their numbers six is an almost is an almost unheard of number i the only maybe one of your listeners will be able to correct me my in case i'm just reaching in memory at this i think the only one that is really comparable is Tsar Ivan the Fourth, Tsar Ivan the Terrible, who we think was married seven times. But for but for a Christian monarch, bear in mind Christian monarchs had to marry monogamously. They weren't allowed um polygamous no Christian monarchs never polygamous marriages. So six wives for a Christian monarch is mm. most unheard of, as I said. And so we, that's why we're we're still talking about them and still looking at them and still thinking of them. And I think so I think that actually I hadn't ever really thought of that. It's a great question. I think is Elizabeth elevated to great applause for exactly the same reason she's damned to a leader cultural amnesia which is that mm. she did it too well and also that she had a husband who enabled encouraged and applauded her for doing it well and i think that's kind of the reason why some people believe that henry VIII would later use his mother as a, a model almost for a wife like that's what he was looking for i know that some people argue that when he did go when he was having issues with Catherine of Aragon, he tried to yeah. model almost Anne Boleyn into that. Of course, we don't know mm-hmm. whether she was in the same kind of way as his mother, if she was obedient or not. We don't know if she, if there's any kind of evidence to suggest that she was almost, I wouldn't say the seductress, because I think that is wildly yeah. explained. I think that's just a way of defaming her almost. Yeah. But he does so. Well, it's also not- hindsight writing history, isn't it? It's basically mm-hmm. assuming that she had, for Anne Boleyn to have been the seductress that she has presented us, she would have had to have had I mean it's sort of an Irish phrase but a touch of the gift meaning she would have had to have had power of a clairvoyant to do that mm-hmm. because there was when she was saying no 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 and so I'm at as I said I'm at here for the minute and I was sort of thinking about saying this to you today and we were my taxi got lost I say always do I don't know if you've been to here the roads around here you, you it's really really just gorgeous in the summer and actually I'm going to um see the exhibition later the new Catherine of Aragon and Dolan exhibition they've got but it's a gorgeous I'm very very excited um, but it's a gorgeous, gorgeous spot. But I was thinking, my goodness, this is a mission to get to in t- when the sat nav decides to be slightly possessed. But it's still a lot of twisty roads to get here. And if you were riding a horse from court, the best we can estimate it would take two and a half to three days. So when she leaves court and says, no, I don't want anything more to do with this, it's not a case of him being easily available to get into contact with her. He would really have had to make a huge amount of effort. And he didn't. He didn't come to Heber after her. Mm. He had to send messages. So I think the whole idea of her playing hard to get is hindsight writing history far more than it should do. That's not to say once she had decided, when he sort of unexpectedly proposed, that she didn't decide to make the best of it. But I don't really see her starting to to, to involve herself in politics until about two or three years in. And I, I think she's, I th- first of all, I think she was, potentially to your point, maybe she was clever enough to know 
that she probably would win, and she certainly was very clever. She might have. This is. I hope I'm not being unduly speculative, but that's part of the joy of discussions rather than <laughs> <laughs> rather rather than writing. I would say, is it possible if we're if we're going off the the premise that maybe there's an element of Elizabeth of York here? And again, caveated with all of this is just two historians talking. Did she wonder as someone who was very clever? By contemporary standards, she will win a lot more applause mm. if she doesn't involve herself in politics and is sort of presented to the people as the fair company as queen. And it's only when Blackfriars happen and Woolsey looks like he's dragging his feet and Clement VII seems no closer to a decision three years in than he was in the day they began. That seems to be when she loses patience and thinks, mm. well, I'm going to have to I'm going to have to do something here. So uh, maybe, maybe there was an element of that. I mean, certainly uh, the only thing I can we can say with absolute certainty is that when it comes to painting dynastic propaganda, Henry does have a very famous painting made in which he stands stands in front of the figure of his father and his third wife Jane Seymour stands in front of the figure of his mother as mm. a symbol of sort of dynastic continuity and propriety. And I think that's the thing is that Jane is specifically almost seen as like his perfect wife mm. almost and yeah. people say that obviously he did try to see Elizabeth his mother in his wife Jane and yeah. I did have a question from one of my readers they were wondering if obviously Henry VIII in his womanizing ways did he see even though he saw his mother as the perfect wife did he see his parents marriage one of assumed faithfulness on our part did mm. he see it as perhaps too restrictive for him and did he expect because his mother was obviously obedient and did the job mm. well that his future wife would assume that role as well maybe the truth is we just don't know there's a lot so there's a lot of building blocks that we need to establish there did he see his parents marriage as restricted did he see it as happy we don't know there's actually no comment from henry VIII about mm. his parents marriage at all. I think a lot of us have assumed he must have thought that because we think that. But there are plenty of times when family members have a completely different perspective on their family relationships than people outside do. So unfortunately we just don't know what he thought of his mother or of his parents' relationship at all. Apart from those dynastic portraits, I'm sorry I should point out he does have portraits of his parents and his elder brother Arthur mm. in his private collection. We do know that from his infant. There's not a huge amount of maid of Elizabeth in his reign and there's not a huge amount of dynastic emphasis put on her. Although I should point out that, you know, Mary the First loved her mother Catherine of Aragon and didn't make a huge amount out of her either. So you you can't read too much into that yeah. one way or the other. I, I think probably for Henry with the womanizing, I don't I think we we might be overthinking this. I think unlike his father, he probably was a bit more naturally promiscuous. He also was someone who was, as they say, born in the purple. He was born into royalty. His father was born into civil war and chaos and seeing a guardian beheaded, separated from his mother, fleeing through the streets of Tempe, you know, to escape possible arrest after the fall of the Lancastrians, spending years in exile. And the reason why I stress all that is Henry the Seventh is naturally a lot more cautious because he's been taught to be. Life has his early life has been a lot crueler to him than it ever was to Henry the Eighth. And in that sense, I think Henry the Seventh is someone who who holds a lot of his emotions in check, whereas Henry the Eighth has never had to do that. And I also think maybe he just didn't love Catherine of Aragon as much as his father loved Elizabeth of York. There is a, one of the things I found out when I when I was writing the, the Catherine Hard biography, and the reason why I went back this early was that her father was involved in this particular joust. There is a off misquoted piece of evidence from early in Henry VIII and Catherine of Aragon's marriage that he that he wore that he sort of he rode into to tourneys as I think is it Curloyal or something. Or something he wrote as loyal heart, and it's supposed to be this grand declaration of love to Catherine of Aragon. Until you read the inventories and you realize half a dozen other courtiers did exactly the same thing, and they were all playing characters with similar names out of romantic mythology. So it's possible this idea that there was this great love story between Henry VIII and Catherine of Aragon. When you start to look at it, there's not a massive amount of evidence for it. Certainly, I think she she said they were later on. Catherine talks very movingly about how much she was in love with him. But I don't know if we ever. Maybe the simple. Maybe it's a really simple answer for us. Maybe it's human nature. Maybe Henry VIII did it because or cheated on his wife, and he certainly cheated on Catherine of Aragon very early. 
Mm. It's a lot earlier than people think. This idea that the only mistresses he had were Bessie Blunt and Mary Boleyn. Yeah, there's absolutely... there's evidence to 1510, literally right after they were married. Exactly. That's exactly it. There's evidence within months of, it, mm. of the marriage. And that Catherine was very, very distressed by this. And that that argument is what set her on the policy of never again intervening when her, with her husband's adulteries to the point that, you know, she wouldn't intervene to allegedly, you know, she wouldn't step in to stop maids of honour who maybe didn't want it to happen. And so there's a lot more complexity in that marriage as there would be in any marriage that lasted 20 years. Maybe the answer is that Henry loved her less than his father loved his wife. And also Henry had never learned emotional caution and self-control in the way his father had had to learn it. You can argue that Henry VII arguably had a lot more on his shoulders than his son did. I mean, he had to fight for his throne, he had to secure it. Perhaps there wasn't enough time to be cheating. And as you said, Catherine of Aragon did show the sign of distress Mm -hmm. of the affair that he was caught of at that time. But never again did she stand against him. In fact, there's even evidence of her telling, like her ladies, don't say anything bad against Anne Boleyn. Yeah because she knew how to do it. And I suppose that almost comes into our last question, that obviously her parents, unlike Henry's, had a lot of faults in their marriage. Obviously, Mm. Ferdinand of Aragon cheated on Isabel of Castile quite a lot. I think it's estimated he had somewhere between seven to ten mistresses that we know of and around five to seven legitimate children and I suppose that could have played a part in why she did not go out against Henry or go out against Henry Mm. in the sense that she didn't get angry as Anne Boleyn is noted as have doing perhaps Mm. this kind of moulded her into showing a respect almost because she knew the place of a mistress in the court Maybe. I mean, again, we have to assume, did she, how much did Catherine of Aragon know about her parents' marriage? It's possible that some of the infantas, her and her sisters, would have been shielded from some of their father's behaviour. Uh, certainly, we know that in other courts that, you know, the children of Louis XIV and Louis XV were for a long time, until they became adults, were completely shielded from what their father mm. was, um, was doing. Likewise with uh, some of the children, I think, of Henri IV. Not all of them, though. But I think it's possible. I, I think that's maybe... Um, taking a, I, I don't think Catherine thought it through that way because I think as you've just said the initial reaction was one of extreme distress when this alleged affair with one of the um, Duke of Buckingham sisters happened I think that was something that caused her a great deal of heartbreak and I think Henry responded quite brutally even then and he dismissed Catherine's favourite her one of her closest friends from court rather than his mistress and I think Catherine learned but actually, it wasn't really about respect. It was about, and this is, you know, again, speculative, but it's a recurring theme in Catherine. It's all for the crown. And Catherine is extremely tenacious in defending her own position. And sometimes, unfortunately, that requires making morally ambiguous, or sorry, to be more accurate, morally distressing, emotionally distressing responses for her. I think Catherine was very aware that if she objected, she was going to lose out. Henry had made that clear. It wasn't an empty threat. He'd done it to her before. And also, so not just was she going to lose out, but potentially some of her friends were going to lose their position at court. So Catherine was put in a position where she had to make a decision, I think, about what battles to fight and which ones to walk away from. And that, again, is is a, is maybe more of a testament to her mother. that those are That's the mind of a general. You know when to fight, you know when to surrender, you know when to tactically regroup. And I think, like Isabella, Catherine knew when to do it. Certainly when Catherine was younger, as we all have when we're younger, we make some dating or emotional mistakes that we learn from. We know there is this question of, was Catherine overly close to the slightly disreputable confessor she had, Fray Diego, when she was younger? Was she in a, in a period of intense emotional distress, you know, during her widowhood, which I would say yes to. And she, I think one of the things that she learned from was this possibility that if she remonstrated with Henry about his adulteries, nothing would happen to the mistress, nothing would happen to Henry. She would be humiliated again, and she would lose potentially a close friend from court. And also, crucially for a queen who I think had quite a keen interest in foreign policy, as Catherine of Aragon, of course, did, and we know was was quite effective at it, certainly early in the reign. In this world, you're judged by your political and social clout. It's how you get things done. And you can't really afford to lose too many times because then you start to hemorrhage allies. And so Catherine knew she couldn't win the fight over the mistresses and chose, I think, to preserve her clout in that way. And I think that's why Elizabeth of York is so important to talk about because Mm -hmm. although 
she obviously wasn't there for Henry's marriage to Catherine. She has certainly played a big role in practically all of his marriages because he he looked up to her in a sense and she has played a role. So I think it is quite interesting to see how her marriage with his father has impacted his own in a sense. And also, I think the importance of the marriage on its own. I think Henry the Seventh and Elizabeth of York were king and queen of this really important quarter century that just gets completely overshadowed by the romantic incontinence of their son. And I think they they did an extraordinary job because they died in their beds, and that was not the norm mm. after Henry the Sixth. That had not been the generation. They both had seen parents, um, or sorry, very immediate family vanish or be violently killed, or both. And they had seen a generation just be consumed by this civil war over the throne. That it was a lot of heavy lifting and no small feat to fix that. And I think Henry the Seventh and Elizabeth of York deserve an enormous amount of credit for doing what they did between 1486 and 1503. Well, I think that's all we have time for today. But before we finish, I'd just like to thank you for taking the time out of your day to talk to me about this very interesting topic, as I'm pretty sure that a load of people would like to speak about this and feel that it's something that would need to be brought into the limelight. Well, thank you so much for having me, Emma. This is great questions and such an interesting topic. So I really appreciate it. My pleasure. <laughs>